Section 11.2, Intermolecular Forces. So the bond between the hydrogen and the chlorine in this example is a covalent bond. It's sharing electrons and it's a very tight pull. And I've got two, uh, two molecules of hydrochloric acid in this picture. But what'll happen, interesting, is the hydrogen and the chlorine are different electronegativities. That means that there is, they share electrons a little bit differently. The chlorine has a higher electronegativity, and since that chlorine has higher electronegativity, it's going to pull on the electron uh, pair more strongly than the hydrogen. What happens as a result is that this side is slightly negative, and this slide is slightly positive. So I've got a pole now. This is called a dipole. And as a dipole, I end up with two little tiny magnets. So these magnets are not just uh, connected to each other in terms of the, mo the atoms connected as a molecule, but now the parts of this, so the hydrogen here has a positive and the negative for this, now positive and a negative have an attraction. So these attractions in between molecules are called intermolecular forces, and there's several different kinds, and they ac account for a lot of the physical properties that you see. For instance, if you were going to boil a liquid into a gas, you have to pull them away from each other, and if there is an attraction, you have to break that attraction. If the attraction is stronger, then you're going to have a higher boiling point. The weaker the attraction, the lower the boiling point's going to be because you're ripping these away from each other. Okay? It's not just individuals. All right, So if you were to have um, marbles attached to each other, you could reach your hand into a bucket and get a bunch of marbles. But if you had little pieces of Velcro all in the bucket and you were trying to individually take out a Velcro, you'd have to yank it away from whatever it's stuck to. Okay. So that's the idea of intermolecular forces. There's different types, and they have different strengths. But the strength, this is much weaker than the covalent bond. So if you had an ionic bond, that's going to be the strongest. A covalent bond is usually next in strength. Then you have the intermolecular forces that are weaker attractions. This one is called a an cation or an anion or an ion dipole force. Okay, so an ion, remember, is a positive or a negative, and a dipole, remember, is the idea that it's got, like the hydrochloric acid we saw on the last page, one side is negative, the other is, is positive. Or in the case of a water molecule, one side is positive, one side is negative. It doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's dipole, you're going to have uh, the negative side attached to a, or attracted to a cation, and the positive side is attracted to the anion. So you have an attraction that's called an ion dipole attraction. It's also pretty strong. You also have attractions in between dipoles. Okay, so if you have something that's polar, just like in that first slide we saw with the hydrogen and the chlorine, the hydrogen is delta positive, the chlorine delta negative, the positive and negative want to attract to each other. And the, you're also going to have some repulsion. So in this case, the two positives are going to repel, and the negative and the positive is going to want to attract. So you do have some repulsion, which kind of subtracts from the strength, and you do have some, uh, some attraction. Normally, the attraction wins out. Okay, so overall, that's going to be a gen, you know, pretty much of an attraction, even if it's a weak attraction, a dipole-dipole attraction, is, is a rather strong uh, intermolecular force. So we've looked at two. We've looked at the ion dipole, which is an ion plus something that, that has a polar molecule, and then two polar molecules, dipole, dipole, two polar molecules also um, attracting each other. Now, these these attraction molecules that are attracted statically, st static electricity-wise, where there's a positive and negative attraction, are all called van der Waals. 
think that's a double V, van der Waals forces. Um, and there's several types of van der Waals. The dipole dipole would be a van der Waals. The dipole ion would be a van der Waals. This is also one. This is called a London force. A London force or a dispersion. I think it's actually supposed to be both. A London dispersion force. And a London dispersion force is any atom, even a nonpolar atom, <clears throat> that doesn't have a dipole. The electrons are whizzing around this atom, okay, at pretty close speed of light. At any one instant, it is possible that more than one electron, more than half of the electrons would be on one side. Okay, in the case of helium, you've got two. If you, as they're whizzing around each other, if you were to stop you see that in that instant, you've got two electrons on one side, okay? In the ne the neighboring uh, one, you may not have two on the other side, and so you're going to have a an attraction between the nucleus on one side and the electrons on the other side. That's going to be a London force. It's a instantaneous, momentary dipole force, okay? So let's imagine I have two heliums. Okay, so here's helium. So I've got two positives inside and two negatives. If, for instance, I had two negatives slightly on one side, okay, then one side is going to be delta negative. The other side is going to be delta positive because there's more, there's just the nucleus on that side. There's no electrons to balance it. Well, a negative and a positive, that's a dipole. Even though it's an instantaneous dipole, it is slight attraction. You're gonna, it could then either induce another one next door, like for instance, this guy could push a, uh, or could pull the electrons to it. So in that moment, the electrons could kind of drift to one side of the bed and you would end up with an attraction. That's called a London dispersion force. And it's the weakest of all of the intermolecular forces, but it, it is, it is a force. There is an attraction, even though it's a very weak attraction. Um, your chapter mentioned that these two guys have the same, the same formula. So it's the same number of carbons, same number of hydrogens. But the longer they are, the more they attract because each of these could, could form an attraction. These are smaller, so they're going, their attraction would be weaker. So the longer a molecule is, the higher the boiling point. Even if it's the same formula, you would have a higher boiling point because these attract these all have possibility of attraction, uh, even if they're just London forces. Bec the longer they are, because they can they can connect to each other, or they attract each other along the entire length of the molecule. This is called a hydrogen bond. If you are to have hydrogen, which basically is just a cation, it's just a proton. Okay, and it's attached to, say, a fluorine or a hydrogen attached to a nitrogen or a hydrogen attached to an oxygen. What you're going to see is fluorines, nitrogens, and oxygens are very, very high electronegativity. And they're going to want to attra attract a hydrogen. So if you were to have a hydrogen, say, in this water molecule, okay, and it is it, it tracks to... Uh, to an oxygen that has open electrons. Those electrons are going to, to want to pull to that cation. You're going to get a very high, higher than a normal dipole-dipole interaction. This is called a hydrogen bond. So hydrogen with fluorine, here's hydrogen with oxygen, here's hydrogen with nitrogen, here's hydrogen with, there's another one would be fluorine. Any of, any molecule that's going to have a hydrogen in it, that would attach to another one that would have uh, fluorine, nitrogen, or oxygen will have a higher than normal pull. At higher than dipole dipole, it's called hydrogen bonding. And biochemistry, all of your uh, enzymes and proteins in your body do this all the time. Um, it's like a little Velcro. It's strong enough to pull something together, but it can easily be broken apart with an enzyme if you want something broken apart, like your DNA are attached this way. Uh, the, two, the two bases of your DNA uh, are attached with a hydrogen bond. 
and then a, uh, an enzyme can come along and kind of unzip them, and then you could recopy a, a DNA or whatever like that. So hydrogen bonding uh, has a lot of a lot of consequences. We'll see that in a second when we get to water. So here we're going to see that that if you were to have a hydrogen nitrogen, you would end up with a a, a dipole. Okay, the hydrogen would be very positive, and the nitrogen, since it's elect highly electronegative, is going to hold on to that, and you end up with a dipole. So a hydrogen fluorine, hydrogen oxygen, hydrogen nitrogen forms a very kind of little, it's weak but strong enough to do a lot of, uh, a lot of impact um, attraction between a hydrogen in one atom and a fluorine, hydro, a fluorine oxygen, nitrogen in another. So here's an example. This is a nitrogen compound where the, the hydrogen on one is going to be attracted to the open nitrogen with the, with the lone pair on another, and that's a hydrogen bond. This is water. Water on this side, and this is paraffin wax on this side. If you were to have a piece of solid wax and put it in a jar of melted paraffin wax, the solid would fall to the bottom. If you were to put solid water into some liquid water, the solid water would float. Okay, That means the only way it could float is if it has a lower density. If, if the ice is, has a lower density than the water, then it'll float. Why would it have a lower density? Most substances, water is one of the few exceptions that would have a lower density. Usually when something is solid, it's tighter together, not looser. What you're going to see is that the hydrogen bonding between the hydrogen, this is hydrogen and this is the oxygen, okay, electronegative, so this is the delta negative and this is the delta positive. This, this hydrogen bonding, as it's freezing, is going to kind of get together and form a very, very regulated hexagon, okay, a hexagon. By the way, this is the reason why that a snowflake is always hexagonal. Okay, they, they picked a 12 here, snowflake, stupid picture. They, most snowflakes are sixes. This is a 12 because it's a double snowflake, actually. Uh, but in any case, the, it's a six because water freezes as a hexagon. All this is empty. There's nothing there. And so the density, there's more volume but less stuff. So the density is lower and ice floats. And you can see that... That, that since it's empty space, the same amount of water is going to occupy more space than the water. And so that's why it's denser. Or the, the water is actually denser and the ice would float on the water.